Amen, amen. Hey, you got your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 10. There we go, Mark chapter 10. Uh, hey man, how about those ags? Big win yesterday, is that good? Yeah, yeah. Listen, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with you. Uh, I am a little bit of a fanatic when it comes to some sports. All right? I, uh, I embarrassed my daughter yesterday. Uh, my wife was gone on a trip, and so my daughter had the great privilege of watching the game with me. And so since my wife wasn't there, uh, usually I will, when the Aggies score, especially when they score a game-winning touchdown, I will, I will give out the love to everyone in the room, right? My sons, it doesn't matter. High school son, middle school son, it doesn't matter. Like everybody's getting getting kissed. The dog is getting, everybody is getting kissed on the, on the mouth, right? I, I'm just super excited. And when the Aggies scored that last touchdown, I jumped up and looked at my daughter and she just like covered up with a blanket. Like she knew it was coming, right? Uh, and I, I, I love, I love sports, love watching sports. Uh, that's like the only station that I have like memorized on my TV is 206 because that's ESPN. I, 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 I'm a fan. I, I'm a fan. But my fandom, if that's even a word, has limits, okay? Uh, I do not own any jerseys with another man's name on the back, okay? I, I just don't. I, that's, that's just, I, for some reason, I don't know if that's you, like if I'm calling you out, I don't even have a text to go with this or anything, so this isn't like biblical rebuke or anything. It's just too far for me. I don't know about you. I don't know if you're like, man, that's just too far, but I just, I just don't do it. I just cannot do it, but it is a big deal. Uh, matter of fact, I don't get to watch much NFL football, but they, they scan the stands and there are all of these grown men with jerseys, with younger men's names on the, I just, that's weird to me, right? And, and so I did a little bit of research this week and found out that the number one selling jersey is LeBron James. And it has been for years. And we have a picture, I think, we have a picture. Uh, let, let, me, let me just say this. That's not LeBron James, either one of those people, all right? But here's what I think it is. Here's, here's where I think this whole wearing another man's jersey comes from, okay? This is where I think. When we were younger, we had superhero pajamas, all right? And so we were like, put on the little cape and put on the Superman thing, and we would get all excited, and we were like, we felt like we were that superhero. And, and so I think nobody ever rebuked us. Like, we, we turned like 15, 16, and nobody was like, hey, that was cool when you were six, it's not cool now. And so now we have new superheroes, right? Now, there are still those people who line up at Star Wars conventions and wear the whole thing. But I'm talking about like the, the people that wear these jerseys. Now, what's fascinating about that, and I, and I had to explain that because some of y'all aren't basketball fans. Some of y'all aren't even like sports fans. That I was like, hey, neither one of those people is LeBron James. LeBron James is six foot nine inches tall. LeBron James is 270 pounds and is more athletic than you or I. And I don't even have to know you. He's more athletic than you. He just is, all right? He can do things. He can dribble. He can dunk. He can move in ways that are just crazy to me. But here's what's fascinating is that people put on that jersey because they feel like they're him. It's not just we're supporting him. It's we feel like we are him. Now, the problem is you're not right? We're not. We're nothing like him. We're not as tall. We're not as big. We're not as muscular. You probably don't spend a million dollars a year like LeBron James on your body. A million dollars a year keeping his body finely tuned to perform in the NBA. We just, we just don't do that. But here's the, here's the problem. We can't dunk like him. We're not athletic like him. None of those things, but we want to be like him. But putting a jersey on does not make us like him. Here's where I'm going with this. In the same way, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Man, has called you and I as Christ followers to imitate him, to look like him. And that doesn't just start with wearing Christian t-shirts. It starts with our very heart's desires. All right, so if you got your Bibles, look at Mark chapter 10, Mark 10, we're going to see where Jesus goes after our desires right here, starting in verse 35, verse 35, Mark chapter 10, it says this, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, these are two, or, two of his followers. If you've read your Bible very much, you know that you've heard these guys' names. They're part of the inner circle, 
They were called the sons of thunder. I mean, they've got a nickname. Jesus gave them a nickname. That's pretty cool if Jesus gives you a nickname. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now, maybe some of you have prayed that prayer before. You're like, God, I'm just going to throw this out. I want you to do whatever I ask. I'm about to, uh, my, my kids do this all the time. They'll come up to me and they're like, Dad, will you do something for me? And I was like, well, it kind of depends. Yeah, I mean, if I can, they're like, no, no. I need you to say it now before I ask you, will you? And I'm like, no, that's manipulation. You're a little sinner. Get out of here with that, right? No, the answer is no then, all right? Th- this is what I feel like James and John are doing to Jesus. Th- they're manipulated. They're like, hey, will you, we want you to do something for us. These are our desires. Now listen, desires in and of themselves are not bad, are they? Like God has given us desires. Matter of fact, God has not just given us desires, he has made us desirous creatures. I don't know if you've noticed this, but we're always in need of something, aren't we? We're always wanting something. All the time, we're like, I want this, I want this. Even when we get that, we'll shift our attention very quickly. You're like, oh, I just want the new iPhone, or I just want that new shirt, or I just want those pants, or I just want that hat. And all of a sudden we get it, and we're like, man, I really want this over here and I need this. And and, and all of a sudden our list changes and we're on to the next thing. But see, I think God has created us as desirous beings so that ultimately we would desire something better, that we would desire him. Because in, in all reality, he's the only thing that will satisfy you and I. It's him. We just sang about that in the first song, that Jesus is better Jesus is better. Jesus is better. And I loved how Josh and the band just kept singing that line over and over and over. And I got real convicted. I was like, do I get this? Do I say this in my everyday life? You, you're better. You're better than anything else this world has to offer. Sex, drugs, food, clothes, a house, a car, you are better. You're better than that degree. You're better than that job. You're better than that career. You are better. And if God would just give us wisdom to think through that, that all of the things that that we're desiring here on earth are, are gonna be gone. Like, have you ever noticed your iPhone after about two or three years starts kind of acting up? And, it always, and there's like conspiracy theories about this. I don't know if you've read this. That people think that they'll start, that they got a little bug in your iPhone to make it start kind of tripping a little bit just in time for the new iPhone so that you'll go, you know what, I, I need a new iPhone. This thing is taking like six seconds to get to my webpage. And people are like whining and complaining because they want the new iPhone. I mean, even that blessed thing that's sitting in your pocket or sitting in your lap right now that you're like, this is awesome, I love this. I have the world at my fingertips. It's gonna go in the trash pretty soon. Or maybe you're like me and you have 15 iPhones stacked up in the corner of your closet. Anybody else? Yeah, hoarders. All right, anyways. um, But see, God has created us to be desirous beings, so ultimately, we would desire the greatest desire, Jesus Christ. Let's keep going, let's keep going Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in glory. This was, this was their desire. Now listen to Jesus' response in verse 38. Listen to this. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or, or are to be baptized with the baptism of which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. You see, what Jesus was talking about here is is he's going to the cross. Matter of fact, if you back up in the gospel of Mark three times, three times already, Jesus has said, hey, listen, I'm about to go die. 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 Matter of fact, he starts, he starts laying it out. Hey, here's how it's going to happen. I'm not just going to die. They're going to come and arrest me. They're going to do this to me. They're, They're going to do all these things and I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Matter of fact, if you just look up in the very uh, passage in 32 through 34, he tells them the third time, hey, here's what's going to happen. But what we see in verse 45 is the why. And we'll get to that here in a minute. But what he's talking about is drinking this cup. He's talking about the suffering, that Jesus would endure great suffering, that he would go to the cross on our behalf, and he would suffer. He would be beaten 
He would be flogged. He would be punched. He would be spit upon. He would have his beard ripped out in places. He, he was going to suffer. He was going to suffer greatly. He would, not only just the physical torture, but he was also going to suffer incredible emotional torture. I mean, can you imagine that you've told all your friends, hey, this is what's going to happen to me. This is what's going to happen to me. This is what's going to happen to me. And then the third time that you say it, they go, hey, listen, that's great. You're going to die or whatever. I don't know. But hey, can I get all your stuff? Can, can, Can I sit at your right hand and your left? I mean, can you imagine you telling your closest friends, hey, guys, I feel like I'm going to die today. And they're like, ooh, can I get your room? Ooh, can I get your bed? Can I drive your car? Can I have that one shirt in your closet? I mean, I feel like that's what's going on here. And then to take it a step further, it's exactly what happens. When Jesus finally gets arrested, all of them flee except for two. And one of them would go on to deny him three times. This is the emotional suffering that Jesus would endure. And it doesn't just stop there. He says that you would be baptized with the baptism that that I am baptized with. You, You know what he's talking about there? And we talk about this when we do our celebration services, when we baptize people in that coffin looking thing. You remember that? We have celebration services, and it's awesome. And, and if, you're, if you're new to church, you're like, this is weird. Why is there a coffin on the, on the stage? What's going on? And it's a baptistry. It's filled with water. But that whole thing is symbolic of you are now dead to your old life and now alive in Christ Jesus. That's why we do baptism. It's also why we don't baptize infants. We baptize adults or people that understand what's going on because they're going, hey, I am now dead in Christ and alive in Christ, dead to my old way of life and now alive in Jesus Christ, just like every other instance in the scriptures. Suffering and death. And Jesus explains to him, he's like, hey, listen, I know you want position, but but that's not really what you're going to get. Verse 40 But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And then check it out in 41. You would think he would rebuke them by now. Like you would think Jesus would be like, hey, bro, slow your roll. I just told you I was going to die and you want my stuff. You want my, you want this position, but he doesn't. I love this about Jesus, how patient and gracious he is. Verse 41. And when the 10 heard it, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, verse 41. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John, and he called them to him, and he said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and they're great ones to exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. For whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. You see, I love that Jesus does not rebuke the disciples for their desire to be great. He redefines their definition of greatness. You see, every one of us in here have a desire to do something. We want to go to school. We want to get a degree. We want to climb that ladder. We want to do this. We want to have these things. And listen, all of those things are well and good. But that doesn't equal greatness. You see, Jesus is going, hey, in the kingdom of God, this is what greatness is. I know the world tells you to make a lot of money, to be, have influence and be successful. That's what the world's pushing. Go, this is great. This is great. This is great. But what Jesus is saying, greatness is you being a servant to people. You see, God may very well in his sovereignty give you greatness in life. But are you going to, are you going to use it to serve people? That's what, what's great in the kingdom of God. That's what God is applauding. That's what he's saying, this is what's great. You see, greatness in the kingdom of God is not about a seat, it's about service. It's not about a seat, it's about service. And then I love Jesus, they called him the great teacher over and over again, and here's why, because he didn't just teach him something and move on, he began to illustrate it. Check it out, he gave him a demonstration. Look in verse 45. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, Jesus isn't just talking about greatness. He's not just teaching about greatness. He's not just redefining greatness and going, this is what greatness is about. You need to pursue good, godly greatness. No, Jesus gave them a demonstration, an example of true greatness. And he gave it to them in and of himself. And this is what's wild about this, that the Son of Man, Jesus is, has, has been called this from, from the ancient of days. Check out uh, Daniel 7. You got your Bibles? Go to Daniel chapter 7. 
If you hit Psalms, Proverbs, uh, keep going, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the way to Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. I'm going to give you just a little bit to get there, but I want to show you where this whole Son of Man came from and why it's such a big deal that Jesus is saying that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Y'all there? Say amen. Daniel 7. All right, 19 of you. Good job. All right, here we go. Daniel 7, starting in verse 13. This is an Old Testament prophecy about the coming of Jesus, about what Jesus would be like. It's the first time that he was really laid out as the Son of Man. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, uh, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Now check it out. Check what the Son of Man is given. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Why? Why was he given all those things? That all peoples, all nations, all languages should serve him. You see, the Son of Man was given all the glory, all the dominion, all the power, all the kingdoms, all of these things. Why? So that every nation should serve him. Now, why, why should they serve him? Because his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. You see, listen, church, this is why I think idolatry in our, in our culture is so, so terrible. It's so sinful because when we lift up people like a LeBron James or this athlete or this actress or this singer, we're going, listen, you're glorious. You're awesome. You're powerful. We love you. And their glory is like like dew. It's here in the morning and it's gone. It's gone. All of our glory is like that. But the glory of God lives forever. Forever and ever and ever. There is no end to it. Like as, as great of a basketball player as LeBron James is, one day he's going to get old and his knees are going to go bad and it doesn't matter how many millions of dollars a year he spends on his body, it's going to weaken. It's going to happen. How do I know that? Because it's happened to every other human on the planet. I mean, I grew up in my day watching MJ, Michael Jordan, and I remember him just doing unbelievable things where we were like, I, I, I need to rewind that. I can't believe a human just did that in front of all those people with a basketball. I can't believe he jumped from here. and Like, I can't believe it. But you know what I also got to see? I also got to see him get old. I also got to see him age to the point that he was like, hey, I, 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 need, I need to retire and quit playing. You see, glory, the man's glory is fleeting. It's fading. But God's glory never, never fades. It never fades away. It never diminishes. It's always glorious forever. Not just in this life, but for eternity. Amen? This is why we worship. This is why we gather together on Sundays and we go, it's you. It's you, it's your glory, it's, it's your dominion, it's your power, it's your kingdom. This is why we come and celebrate. This is why on Sundays we go, this is what this is about. It's not about me and how I feel getting out of bed or waking up from my nap or what I've got to do tomorrow. Jesus in his glory is worth my worship. He's worthy of it. He's worthy of it. And so I get up and I get dressed and I put some foo-foo cologne on and I smell good because I, I want to come here and just give him what's due his name because this is all I have. It's all I have. It's the Son of Man in all of his dominion, in all of his glory, in all of his power. But here's what's crazy is that the text said that all nations should serve him. But Mark 10.45 says, that he didn't come to be served, but came to serve. You see, this is why our Jewish friends have such a, such a struggle believing that Jesus was the Messiah. Because they read Old Testament texts like that and they knew what they were looking for. And so when this man shows up who's born of a teenage girl in a barn in Bethlehem from Nazareth, they're going, hey, it doesn't add up. 
Oh, I know Micah 5, 2 says he's going to be born that way. I know Zechariah 9, 9 says he's going to ride. And I know all these things are going to happen. I know all of these prophecies, but they can't get over the fact that the son of man who should have all the nations, every people, tribe, tongue, and language serving him comes to serve. It blew their minds. They're like, well, that's not how it should be. You see, they're like, Jesus didn't fulfill that. Let me just say this. Jesus didn't fulfill it in his first coming, but he fulfills it now. Amen? And he will fulfill it in glory. Because at the end of all time, Paul would say this in Philippians 2, every tribe, every tongue, every language, every nation, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's going to happen. You know how I know? Because every other promise has been fulfilled. Every other prophecy has been fulfilled. So why would we doubt that the end's not going to happen? It's all happened. But this is why the Jews, they just can't get it in their brains, they can't get it in their hearts to absorb this kind of son of man that would come to serve, not be served. That would come to give his life as a ransom for the many. You know what ransom means? Ransom is the price to buy the freedom of a slave or prisoner. Matter of fact, that that word in the Greek, that word in the Greek is used to, to buy like the lowest. There were like servants and then there were slaves. And, and, and these were uh, condemned criminals. These were uh, people who had, had, had no right to get out of slavery. You see, we don't understand biblical slavery, but what would happen in the Bible is that people could become servants. So let, let's say that my family had a huge debt and we couldn't get out of debt. What I could do in biblical times is I could in, in, uh, become a servant to a family in order to get out of debt. But then the great thing about their slavery in their day, as opposed to what we understand in our day in America is that they would finish off paying off their debt and they're like, hey, thank you so much for pay, let, allowing me to pay off that debt. Now I'm going to go back to my family and I'm going to live a prosperous life. It wasn't a lifelong slavery, but this is what we find in the scriptures. This is what a ransom does. It buys a condemned criminal. It buys an indentured servant, slave, or a prisoner of war. Can I be real honest with you? This is what he did for us. This is what he did for us. But the problem is, is that when we can't receive that ransom because we think of ourselves too high. You see, you can't come to Jesus thinking that you belong on a throne or you belong at his right or at his left in glory without getting really, really low. That's why Jesus would say in Matthew 5.3 in the Sermon on the Mount, Hey, blessed are you who are poor in spirit, that you're spiritually bankrupt, that you go, I've got nothing to offer. But so many of us come to Jesus and we're like, hey, Jesus, check out my resume. Look at all the things that I've done. Look how great I am. Look at all these Awana awards I won. Look at my sash. Look how smart I am. Look how gifted I am. I got into a and I've got this degree. I've got this job. I make this amount of money. Look at my influence in, in, in the community. And we don't come low and spiritually bankrupt going, hey, that's me. I'm a condemned criminal. Like that spot on the cross, Jesus, that you took, that's my spot. That's how you ransom me. I was literally a slave. I was a servant. I, I was a prisoner of war, en enslaved to the enemy of the world. Ephesians 2 talks about this very thing. They were enslaved to the prince and the powers of darkness. Do you understand that's your place? Or are you still trying to be great in the eyes of the world? This is who Jesus came to ransom. And this is how he ransomed them. The Greek word there for, for the many, where it says he gave his life as a ransom for the many. He's not talking about just this number. He's talking about this idea of instead of, in place of, as a substitute for. That's how he did it. It's like as, as if you and I were up on that cr cross condemned 
a condemned criminal, deserving of death. And Jesus said, no, 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 take him down. I'll take his place. That's the gospel. Do you see yourselves like that? Or do you see yourselves as great in the world's eyes? You see, the question that we've got to pose to ourselves is this. Are we really following Jesus? Are we really trying to be like Jesus? And I know the initial answer would be, yeah, I want to be like Jesus. It's why I'm here. It's why I got my Bible. It's why I'm taking notes. It's why I'm doing all these things and going to Bible study and, and coming to worship services. But are we really trying to be like Jesus? Because Mark 10, 45 cuts us to the heart. You see, will you seek to be served or will you seek to serve others? Keep your finger there. Turn over to John chapter 13 real quick. John 13. Give you a little bit, bit of background before we start in verse 13. This was the last time that Jesus would be with his disciples. So you can imagine, you've, you've walked with these guys for three years. You've poured your life into them. You've, you've served them. You've taught them. You've rebuked them. You've corrected them. You've done all these things. You've given them opportunities to serve in, in mission and to preach and to cast out demons and all these crazy things. This whole time, that would be the last time that he would, he would be with them alone before his, his arrest and before his trials and before his, his execution. And he would use this opportunity to share with them his most important thing. This is the last words, the last words. And he would not only teach it to them, but he would demonstrate it to them. Look in verse 13. He says, do you not understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you were right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. You see, Jesus wasn't just talking about washing people's feet. The takeaway here is not that you're like, okay, I guess I need, I've never washed anybody's feet. I guess we need to get like a basin and go home and wash my, my wife's feet or my, my roommate's feet or whatever. That, that's... I mean, you could do that, but what Jesus is saying here, he's going, hey, listen, I'm giving you an example. I'm giving you an example, and this example the disciples understood, because in their day and age, you had all kinds of servants within the house. You had some that cooked, and some that cleaned, and some that did this, and did that, and all these different things, but the lowliest servant in the house, you know what they did? They sat by the door, and when people came in with their chacos, just kidding, they didn't have chacos then. Some of y'all are like, Yes. When they came in with their sandals and their feet were all filthy and grimy because they didn't walk around on paved streets like you and I did and paved sidewalks, they came in from dusty roads that that servant would sit there and th that servant would sit them down in his seat and they would, they would get down and they would wash that person's feet before they came in. They would cleanse their feet. That was the lowliest job of a servant. That's why when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, Peter refused. He's like, you're not washing my feet. No, no, you, you, I know who you are. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. You're the son of man in all his dominion and all of his glory and all of his power. You're not washing my feet. But Jesus wanted to serve them. And so Jesus took the lowliest place in their society and served them. Do you understand that Jesus has done this for us? Do you understand that in serving you and cleansing you and giving his life up, he is taking the lowliest job in order to serve you? Have you taken his example and done the same? Like you, you, know, what, you know what I hear a, a lot here at church? People are like, hey, um, hey, I, I, I want to serve. And, I, and I, we don't hear that a ton, but we do hear that some. But you know what I'll start doing? You know what I always lead off with? I'm like, hey, you know what you can do if you really want to serve? You can stack chairs. Yes, they're heavy, they're bulky, you might pinch a finger. You can, you can go out in the parking lot and sweat for like an hour before the service and have people yell at you when they don't get a front row parking spot and, and tell you they're number, you're number one with not, not so great of a finger, right? And, and, and all these things, I mean, this is what our parking team endures at times. And people yell at them and people, all these things. Like, do you want to serve? Do you want to take the lowliest spot? Or do you come in going, hey man, I'd really like to serve. Does anybody in here need teaching? 
Anybody, anybody need me to preach to them? Anybody need that? Because that's what, that's what I'm, I'm good at, preaching to them. And listen, you may be an incredibly gifted teacher, incredibly gifted preacher, but if you're not willing to stack chairs and serve in the lowliest way, then you don't need to be preaching and teaching. Why? Because we want servants living that stuff out. Have you taken on Jesus' example? Like, do you find the lowliest places to serve and go, that's where I'm going to begin? When I first started in youth ministry, I got this internship. I got paid like $9.23 a year. It was amazing. And I remember thinking, I was like, this is going to be awesome. Like, I'm going to get to preach and teach. I'm going to get to do all these things. And, and, and I was working for this guy, and, and it was in Abilene. It was like August. It was 142 degrees outside. And, and I was like, this is going to be great. And so I showed up. He's like, hey, be here tomorrow at 3.30. And I was like, this is awesome, 3.30. I'm probably going to like, get ready to preach and teach that night. And, and as soon as I got there, he's like, great, you're here. What's your name again? I was like, Blake, that's awesome. All right, come on. Come on, bud. And he takes me out to this old, stanky gym. And the, the air conditioning wasn't on. It was one of those air conditioning units like you had to like crank a wheel and it like, right? And it came on. It took like 30 minutes to cool down to under 100 degrees. And then he, he sees this whole gym and it was bigger than this room. It was a massive gym. And he's like, I need 300 steel chairs set up in here for tonight. And I was like, awesome. Do I get like a team? Is there like a team of volunteers? He's like, that's you, brother. you the team of volunteers. And I was like, okay. And so I like took my shirt off and just started like setting out chairs. And I had to do that every week, every week for months, for months until we hired some other sucker. And then he helped me. I was like, isn't this great? This is awesome. This is what we signed up for, setting up chairs. Like, are we willing to do the lowliest job? Because listen, we always talk about how we want to be like Jesus. And, and there are some things in there that we're going to live like Jesus and love like Jesus and do all these things. But what Jesus is saying by his own admission is that the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve. Is that how you approach the church? You see, there's a lot of freshmen in here, a lot of new people, a lot of transfers, a lot of people checking out. Do you come into church going, hmm, what does this guy have to offer me? Oh, the worship, mm, B plus. Sorry, Josh. A plus, A minus. We'll give you an A minus. <clears throat> I, I like this, but the chairs are kind of, you know, they're kind of squishy or there's not enough room or, or do they have this or it's at five o'clock instead of I wake up early and I want to go to a 10 o'clock or all of these things. Do we just sit back and critique all of these things or do we look at church and, and go, hey, how can I serve this place? Is there a way for me to invest and give my life away and actually be Jesus to these people? Thank you. Is that how we approach things? Because I'm looking at the scriptures, I'm going, that's what he's saying. Have, have you looked like me? Have you served like me? Have you taken the lowliest position? Or do you consider yourselves greater than your master? greater than the one who sent you, that Jesus was willing to get low and get dirty and wash disciples' feet, but you won't do that. You're like, no, service really isn't for me. See, I'm doing all these other things. I don't really have time to serve the church. Praise God Jesus didn't say that. Like, praise God he didn't go, you know what? Mm, suffering, death, mm, that looks a little hard. I don't think I can do that. I had a little girl a couple years ago, and, I, and I, I loved this young lady. She was in our youth ministry, and she came up to me, and I was like, girl, where you been? You've been missing like two Sundays. Where you been? Like, you need to be here. And she's like, I've just been so tired, and I just didn't feel like coming. And I was like, good thing Jesus didn't say that on the cross. Good thing he didn't go, you know what? I'm tired. I've been up late. I got beat all night. I'm just not going to do this. And she kind of looked at me shocked, and I was like, I'm kidding, kind of. But seriously, though, you need to be here. Little prophetic edge right there. And I'm just looking at that. I'm going, do we give that excuse? We're like, Jesus, I know you served and you washed people's feet and you gave your life away, but I don't really have to do that. But I want to be like you. Those things don't add up. They don't add up. And then secondly, will you give your life away for the sake of the gospel? Turn over to Matthew chapter 10 and then I'm done. Matthew chapter 10. 
Matthew 10, starting in verse 37. All right, here we go. Verse 37, he says this. I'm kind of cutting in the middle of a thing, but he says, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Three things that we see in here about what it looks like to give your life away for the gospel. One is that you love Jesus more than anyone or anything. You love him. You you, you love him. I run into this all the time with students that come in. They're like, listen, I feel a call to ministry, but my parents are really against that. They don't want me to be broke. They don't want me to suffer. They don't want me to whatever. They, don't, they want me to you know, go to May's business school and get a business degree and, and go this route and do this thing. And, and so then there's this struggle and it's, there's whole thing and they're pulling out scripture like, I need to honor my mother and father, but I also need to honor God and obey God, what God's calling me to do. Listen, you're gonna have this come up over and over and over. I also see students that come to me and they're like, listen, I, I'm, I've started dating this person and they're really awesome, they're really nice, they're great, man, they're just so kind. I'm like, do they love Jesus? Well, we haven't really gotten to that part. I mean, we've only dated for like a year and so I haven't really figured that out yet. Um, but they're just so kind and so nice and so, and you just have all these things. I'm like, but, but do they love Jesus and submit to Jesus? Because if you're going to go, hey, I'm going to marry this person and spend the rest of my life and be in a covenant relationship and make vows to this person, and yet my allegiance is to Jesus and I need to obey him, that's going to be really difficult. It's going to be really difficult. That's why Paul would say we don't get unequally yoked. Do you love Jesus more than anyone, more than anything? It, it, it's that simple. And then he says... In verse 38, take up your cross and follow him. You see, it's progressive. If, we're, if we love Jesus more than anything, then we're willing to do anything. If we love Jesus more than anyone, we're willing to do anything, which means I'm willing to suffer and die. I mean, this is back to James and John in, in, in Mark 10, where, where Jesus says to them in verse 39, you will drink the cup. Can, can I be real straight with you and I'm gonna run some of you off? You follow Jesus, you are going to suffer. I mean, I'm not trying to preach a prosperity gospel like you come down front, shake my hand, say a sinner's prayer, I'm gonna do some voodoo magic on you and then you'll never suffer again. It'll be awesome. You'll just have this really weird smile on your face. You'll look like Joker from Batman and you're just like, things are great, hunky, it's awesome. No, you're going to suffer. Matter of fact, Paul would say in 2 Timothy 3.12, if you wanna follow Jesus, you will be persecuted. Even in Aguilan. Even in the Bible Belt, you will. You will. You will. Are you willing to suffer and die for Jesus? To drink the cup and be baptized with the baptism that he was baptized with? And then the third thing in verse 39, he says, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is what it looks like for you to give your life away for the sake of the gospel, that you're like, my life outside of Christ is not worth my life that could be in Christ. Let's swap. Because over here, I'm trying to build a kingdom for me and do all these things for me and trying to climb the ladder of greatness. And guess what? It's not fulfilling. But what Jesus says, when we give our lives away for the sake of the gospel, then we find life. It's this really strange paradox, is it not? Hey, die and you'll find life. Give your life up and then you'll find life. But it's the truth of the gospel and it's proven in the gospel. That Jesus said, hey, I'm gonna go to the cross and I'm gonna die a horrific death and I'm gonna give my life away as a ransom for many, but then he gets glory forever. Do you trust Jesus enough? Do you trust the gospel enough to actually find your life in him? Do you really want to be like Jesus? And I'm not just talking about wearing the t-shirt or wearing the jersey that says, look, look, I'm like Jesus. Then you suffer like Jesus. 
and you serve like Jesus and you give your life away for the sake of the gospel like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your, the truth of your word. Your church is built on it. This church is built on it and nothing less. And even when we have to face really difficult passages like this, it's just a good call. It's just a good reminder of what it looks like to follow Jesus. Because for some, for some reason, for some, something, we've tried to make it comfortable. We've tried to make it easy. We've tried to say, "Hey, I know Jesus said that the way is narrow." But man, I really want it broad and I really want it paved and I really want it easy. And and that's not the truth. But you did call us to come and suffer with Jesus and to die to ourselves so that we might find life. And so I pray tonight whether we're wrestling with this idea of greatness and, and, and maybe we just get real. And I know church isn't really the place to get real sometimes, but maybe tonight we just get real and go, have I so bought into the world's definition of greatness that I have forsaken Jesus' redefinition of greatness to serve? Have I so bought into this idea that I am above my master that I don't need to serve, I don't need to give my life away because even though Jesus did that, even though he took the lowliest places, would our friends, would our family, would people around us look at us and go, that person is a servant. I mean a servant. Or have we so self-deceived ourselves into thinking that we're like Jesus, but we're really not. We go to church, we go to Bible studies, we, we read our Bible every once in a while, and we're, we're somewhat kind to people, but we don't serve, we don't give our lives away for the sake of the gospel. Lord, I pray for your church tonight that we would repent of those things that we would respond appropriately here in a minute when we've got a little response time. We wouldn't just sit there, take some good notes, close it up and go, where are we going to dinner? But we'd really wrestle with the truth of your word and say, man, I want to look like Jesus. I don't look like him enough right now, but I want to. I want to be a servant. I want my life to be identified with Jesus in every which way. God, I pray you would do all of that and more tonight. And for our friends in here who are visiting, who've never surrendered their lives to Christ and they've tried religion, but they've never tried Jesus, I pray that they'd see the difference. That it's not just church attendance that's going to make them better and get them into heaven, but it's a relationship with the righteous one, the son of man. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Have you ever taken up the cross and said, I I exchange my life, all of my good things, all of my resume, all of my righteousness for yours? Because that's what's going to count on judgment day when I stand in front of a holy God. Not my righteousness, not my resume, but Jesus's. And if that's you, we, we encourage you tonight. All it takes is a, is a simple prayer where you go, I, I confess you are God, I'm not I am not righteous by my own deeds, but I'm righteous by yours. And so can we, can we exchange these things? And I want to begin a relationship with you that looks like following you and imitating you and looking like you. So God, I pray that you would do all that and more tonight. May your spirit have free reign in this place. And may we meet with you. May we obey you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.